Hello, I'm Dr. Collins and in this concept video we are going to have a look at pediatric rushes. We are going to create a table together that will include everything you will need to know about these seven most important childhood exanthems and by the end of this video you will be able to confidently answer most of the exam questions regarding these infectious diseases and more importantly you will have a very comprehensive summary to quickly refer back to in clinic to remind yourself of the salient points of each disease for quick reference. Okay, here we go. Let's start with one of the most common childhood rushes, the super itchy and therefore annoying chicken pox, also known as varicella, because it's caused by the varicella zoster virus, which belongs to the family of human herpes viruses, and it is contagious from one to two days before the rush appears, during which the child will have fever, aches, loss of appetite, and the child is still contagious until all the blisters have crusted over, which usually takes around five to seven days. The rash is classically referred to as vesicular or an erythematous background, but in reality, it actually goes through three stages. Initially, they start as spots, then they become vesicles, quite blistery, and then they scalp over. The rash often first appears on the face, trunk or proximal limbs before spreading to the rest of the body. A couple of important clinical points to remember is that this rash is super itchy, so it is vital to apply some conservative measures to prevent secondary bacterial infections from severe pruritus by asking families to cut the nails of their children short and offering some antipruritic agents such as calamine lotion or antihistamines. Most people suffer from this virus once in their lifetime, but remember, this virus is super sneaky. It can go and lay dormant in the dorsal root ganglia, and in the future, when there's extreme stress or immune suppression, it can return as shingles, which we'll have to cover in a different video, as it is not a childhood rush, but it's a good place to mention. The school exclusion rule, until lesions are crusted over, exists to protect vulnerable groups who are neonates, immune-suppressed patients, and pregnant women. If a pregnant woman becomes exposed to chickenpox, her immune status needs to be ascertained. If she had chickenpox in the past or had two courses of the vaccine, then she can be reassured. Otherwise, local arrangements need to be made to test for varicella zoster immunoglobulins, and these pregnant ladies may need further intervention by the fetal medicine team to prevent serious complications such as congenital varicella syndrome. Next, we are going to look at enteroviral vesicular stomatitis, which is better known as the hand, foot and mouth disease. This is another condition whose name sort of makes a lot of sense because it mainly affects the hand, foot and mouth of the kids. But don't be too surprised if you also see a bit of rash in the buttocks, legs, arms and genital areas as well. The disease is caused by Coxsackie viruses and in particular the strain A16 and second most commonly by enteroviruses, the enterovirus 71 strain. It initially presents with a few days history of feeling generally unwell and a mild grade fever, and then a maculovesicular rush breaks out. The kids are infectious a few days prior to the onset of symptoms, up to five days after. This is a very common but often mild disease and often no serious complications. Next, we are going to tackle measles, which historically has many other names such as rubiola, the English measles or the first disease. You wouldn't come across these older names anymore unless you're using an older textbook. This might be a good place to explore why certain childhood conditions also have an alternative name that is a number to clarify some terminology confusions. So, before the proper understanding of virology and bacteriology, the older textbooks utilized the numbering system for the most common six childhood rushes that were commonly encountered in patients at the time. The fourth disease is now understood to be a variant of scarlet fever, which was already listed as the second disease, so there are actually five rushes left to cover today. And we will no longer focus on these alternative namings, and in any case, except for the fifth disease, these numerical namings are no longer used. So I wouldn't worry about memorizing these alternative names with the numbers, but just be aware that you might still come across these names, especially with the fifth disease, which is still in use, and for the others in older textbooks and maybe in some medical trivia pub quizzes. Okay, going back to our table, let's explore measles in a bit more detail. It's caused by the measles virus and it is highly contagious four days prior to rush appearing until four days after. Therefore, four days of school exclusion is needed from the onset of rush. 
Measles is very much vaccine preventable and is part of the childhood immunization program globally. The child initially suffers from the classical three C's, cough, conjunctivitis and coryza. The fever is usually quite high and the child will look very irritable and poorly. Inside the mouth, coplic spots might be found, which are small white spots on a reddened area on the side of the buccal mucosa. Remember that measles rash works its way from top to bottom. So you would first get the coplic spots, which are enanthems rashes inside, in this case in the mouth, before any external rashes, exanthems. The maculopapular rash is visible externally first on the face, and then it spreads downwards to the rest of the body. Please note how florid this rash is. The common complications of measles include ear infections, pneumonia, and more serious complications are seizures and encephalitis. So it is quite important to vaccinate kids to avoid measles as its complications can be quite severe. In some countries, vitamin A is readily prescribed for measles cases, but in others, it's reserved for more severe cases and is given under the specialist care only. We are going to look at the next three infections, rubella, erythema infectiosum and roseola infantum together, because just like measles rash, these three diseases also all cause maculopapular rashes. In other words, the rash will have both flat, discolored areas called macules and small, raised, bumpy areas of papules. Because the rashes are so similar, we need to explore these three conditions together to compare and contrast the subtle differences in presenting complaint and clinical signs which will give away the diagnosis. If a child is suffering from any of these three diseases, distinguishing which one the child is suffering from will unlikely make a difference for the management of the child, as they are often mild viral diseases with often no serious significant complications. However, knowing which one it is might make a difference for public health purposes, because rubella requires school exclusion and is a notifiable disease, and both rubella and erythema infectiosum requires caution regarding pregnant women for the unborn fetus. Right, here we go. Here is a list of the four viral exanthems that causes maculopapular rash in kids, with their various other names immediately underneath. They are all caused by viruses, measles by measles virus, then rubella by rubella virus, erythema infectiosum by parvovirus B19, and roseola infantum by human herpes virus 6. So, the first clue in helping us distinguish between these viral exanthems is the severity of the disease. As we previously discussed, the child will be very irritable and poorly with measles, whereas the remaining three infections are relatively milder. Next, we need to consider the color of the rash, which is quite dark red with measles, but a bit lighter, rather more pink in the remaining three diseases. Now, so far we've got two good clues that can help us distinguish measles from the remaining three viral exanthems. What we need now is some more specifics to be able to tell apart rubella, erythema infectiosum and roseola. When we look at the rush in a bit more detail, you will notice that the rush of erythema infectiosum is a bit more lace-like pattern, whereas the rush of measles is very florid, very dense. Also, the measles and the roseola aren't very itchy at all, whereas rubella and erythema infectiosum can be mildly itchy. Measles and rubella rashes start on the face and work their way downwards, whereas erythema infectiosum, or as its very useful and descriptive alternative name suggests, slap cheek disease, starts on the cheeks specifically. Finally, roseola initially starts on the trunk before spreading. Now you already have got quite a bit to go from, ranging from the severity of the infection to the color, the pattern and the origin of the rashes on the body. But next bit of the clues will make it further a lot easier to distinguish between these diseases. We already know about the white coplic spots of the measles inside the mouth that comes on even before the external rash. Rubella has something similar, which is called Forheimer's spots, which are red instead of white on the soft palate. You can get swollen lymph nodes with any infectious diseases, but patients with rubella often get quite significant lymphadenopathy, especially in the postauricular, suboccipital and cervical areas. 
And here's an example of the post-auricular lymphadenopathy. Roseola also has an anonthem, an internal rash, called Nagayama spots, which appears as red papules on the soft palate. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a public domain real-life picture for this, but think of the Nagayama spots as very similar to Forheimer's spots of the rubella, but a little bit more bumpy in papular form. Last but not least, there is a very significant clue in helping us distinguish the roseola and erythema infectiosum from the other exanthems. Both of these diseases become asymptomatic once the rash breaks out. Often, parents come with a child who is otherwise now completely fine, the fever has settled, but there is a macular papular rash which either started on the trunk in the case of the roseola or on the cheeks, like slapped cheeks in the case of erythema infectiosum. And all you have to do is to reassure the parents. We'll come back onto why knowing this clinical fact is important in terms of public health concerns in the case of erythema infectiosum. But the fever breaking and the child suddenly developing a rush after a few days of cold-like symptoms is a dead giveaway pattern for roseola infantum and erythema infectiosum. Going back to our big picture table, I have now populated the information we just derived from our previous slide comparing and contrasting the maculopapular rushes. Before we move on to the final childhood rush that we will discuss today, there are a few things I'd like to point out about the public health aspect of the two maculopapular viral rushes we just discussed. There are in total three diseases, three childhood rushes that has important clinical significance when it comes to protecting the unborn fetus and therefore any pregnant woman exposed to these three conditions needs to be counseled appropriately. We already talked about the chickenpox and the congenital varicella syndrome at the beginning. Here is that information emphasized in green as a summary point. The other two conditions with fetal complication implications are rubella and erythema infectiosum. Very similar to chickenpox, if a pregnant woman is exposed to rubella virus, the vaccination or the immune status of this lady needs to be ascertained urgently. If she had two courses of the MMRI vaccine or if she had positive antibodies against rubella, she can be reassured. Otherwise, again, an urgent contact with the virology or infectious diseases department needs to be made because the unborn fetus may be at risk of congenital rubella syndrome. With parvovirus B19, the fetal complication is fetal anemia, with about 30% transmission risk to the fetus if a pregnant woman was to contract erythema infectiosum during pregnancy. And fetal anemia in severe cases can cause oedema in the unborn child and may lead to death of the baby in uterus, known as hydrops fetalis. As we highlighted in the previous slide, it is a lot harder to diagnose parvovirus B19 while it is still infectious because remember, once the fever breaks and the rush starts, the child is actually no longer contagious. So almost inevitably, the pregnant woman will have been exposed to parvovirus B19 at a time when it isn't easy to discern which infectious disease the child is suffering from. Therefore, you should have an even lower threshold to question if a child presents with slapped cheek syndrome and if there are any family members at home who are pregnant and might have been exposed to this virus during the contagious period. If, again, a pregnant woman's exposure is suspected to erythema infectiosum, it is best to contact the local virology or infectious diseases department to get urgent advice. All right, we're nearly there. Last but not least, we are going to talk about scarlet fever, which is also known as scarlatina. Unlike all the other six infectious diseases, this one is different in the sense that it is actually caused by a bacterium called Streptococcus pyogenes, which is a group A streptococcus. As it is not a virus, but rather a bacterial infection, there is antibiotic treatment for it usually with phenoxymethyl penicillin if the patient is not penicillin allergic. In fact, this childhood exanthem is simply a fairly uncommon complication of the very common acute bacterial tonsillitis, which classically presents with sore throat, fever and lymphadenopathy. I'm afraid this is yet another maculopapular rash, However, fortunately, it has a very distinctive feature in that it feels like sandpaper in texture when examined, which starts on the chest or abdomen before spreading. 
And this is also yet another condition with an anthem, i.e. rush inside the body, and it is known as strawberry tongue, which initially might present as yellowish-white coating on the tongue, but later the coating disappears, leaving a beefy red strawberry tongue. With the discovery of the antibiotics, the complications of acute tonsillitis such as scarlet fever and even the more severe complications such as rheumatic fever are now quite rare. But without antibiotics treatment, the child will be infectious for up to two to three weeks from the onset of symptoms and with the antibiotics only for 24 hours. Well done for your perseverance. There is our table finally complete. If you want to take a screenshot of the table, I hope you will find that it helps you both for your revision for your exams and also in clinic as a quick reference when you need to remind yourself of the subtle differences of these childhood infectious diseases. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please subscribe to support more videos to be made. For free practice questions about this topic and many others, visit our website where you will also find several other videos and related questions. Good luck!